Hi, everyone. Welcome back and welcome to the Innovations and in Traditional Practice panel. My name is Anna Taylor and I'm one of the co-coordinators for the symposium. Uh, the goal of this panel is to discuss traditional ecological knowledge and its role in One Health innovations. Indigenous communities possess an intimate knowledge of eco ecological systems and the relationships between people, plants, animals, and the environment. And these communities are often disproportionately affected by climate change and other One Health issues. In this panel, we have three wonderful panelists who will discuss their work with Indigenous communities and the innovations that arise from the combination of traditional ecological knowledge and Western science. Our panelists will give short presentations followed by a Q&A session, so please direct your questions to the Zoom Q&A. Uh, first off, we have Dr. Colleen Rossier. Dr. Rossier is the Pitka Field Institute Program Manager at the Kurok Tribe Department of National, Natural Resources. In this role, she is responsible for managing the intergenerational learning and food sovereignty aspects of the DNR, which include research collaborations, educational efforts, workforce development training, and food sovereignty work. Dr. Rossier completed her PhD in ecology at UC Davis, foc focused on examining how integrating indigenous and Western sciences can enhance socio-ecological resilience. Please welcome Dr. Rossier. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me on today. It's been awesome to get to join and watch some of the earlier panels. Um, and I'm gonna just start, um, Matt, if you're ready for it, I wanted to start with a little bit of a poll um, to wake everybody up, make sure you're all here with me. Um, so Matt, Blake, if you're ready to throw that on the screen. So my first question is, are you currently involved in research either as a student or do you conduct research yourself professionally? My second question is about um, what aspects of One Health are you involved with? Um, so which of the following do you work with? And please select all that apply from animals to people to plants, bacteria, fungi, viruses, and other. Um, I myself, like some of the other panelists, um, my background is in ecology and specifically plant ecology, um, though I also work with human health in the other half of myself. Um, so I'm very curious to hear where everyone's coming from. Um, and then my third question is, do you collaborate with indigenous people or communities as a part of your work um, or a part of your schooling and education? Um, this could be Native Americans, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, Pacific Islanders, or any other uh, identifying indigenous group. And then my last question is, how familiar are you with the term traditional ecological knowledge? I know Anna mentioned that in, in the opening of our panel. Um, so that could be very familiar, something you're, you're working with knowledge holders and knowledge stewards regularly, somewhat familiar. It's a term that you've encountered um, or not familiar or never heard of it. Um, so I'll give you guys a, a couple more seconds or so to answer these questions and then I'll be very interested to hear uh, your responses. All right, Matt, would you mind closing that poll? Awesome, so we have quite a lot of researchers and about a third who do not do research. It looks like animals are a big emphasis as well as people and probably bacteria and viruses that are causing some infections to both of those, but we do have some plant people, so that's awesome. Um, and it looks like about a quarter of people are collaborating with indigenous communities. So that's awesome. Um, and then TEK, it looks like there's some who are familiar and then there's quite a few who are not. So that's really helpful. Uh, it's great to know who I'm talking to. Um, so I, with that, I will share my screen. Please let me know if you can see this just fine. Are we good? Okay, great. And can you guys hear me okay? All right, wonderful. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about, uh, as Anna mentioned, collaborating across Indigenous and Western sciences, knowledge systems, and approaches to enhancing human, plant, animal, and ecosystem health, and also the importance of Indigenous leadership in that process. So first, I wanted to start with just introducing who I am so you know my background. Um, so I am not Native American. I have mixed European ancestry from primarily the British Isles and a little bit of Scandinavian ancestry as well. 
I was born and raised in the Washington DC area. So a lot of exposure to global issues um, my, my childhood. Um, after college, where I studied environmental science at University of Virginia, I went and worked for the US Department of Agriculture, first in the office of the chief scientist, and then in the National Agroforestry Center, where I got to work on a lot of global food security issues, agroforestry, organic agriculture, and local and regional food systems. And this is the first time I was really introduced to the concept of One Health, uh, because one of our scientists in the office of the chief scientists really uh, focused a lot on the One Health efforts. Um, in 2011, I had the opportunity to visit Uganda and was very inspired by the polycultural food systems that I saw the people in rural Uganda practicing. Um, I started interviewing everyone about kind of how they were growing their food, and it was a lot of um, small scale and kind of diverse patches that people would manage multiple patches um, in the community, and it seemed like they were really mitigating risk in a really interesting way and producing a very diverse set of uh, food crops with minimal inputs. And I, I was very fascinated by this given, you know, the larger monocultures that I'd been seeing in the United States and that I was used to seeing from the United States Department of Ag, uh, both in kind of our cropping systems with a lot of corn and soy, um, and also in kind of confined animal feeding uh, operations where there were a lot of organisms in a small amount of space and how these folks in Uganda who maybe didn't have some of the government programs to support that process or some of the inputs needed to enable that system uh, were, were able to mitigate some of the risks themselves. Um, that inspiration led me to really study agroforestry and, and my interest was to come back to the United States and to work cross-culturally with Native American and indigenous populations around uh, these questions of food security and managing both human and ecosystem health um, symbiotically. And those, those have been two strong interests of mine my entire life. I've never really been able to say, you know, one is more than more important than the other to me. So um, I really appreciate the One Health community for that. Um, and that brought me to UC Davis, where I studied uh, ecology for my PhD with Dr. Dave Rizzo, who I imagine many of you here know. Um, and that is where I did started to collaborate with the Kaduk and Yurok tribes back in 2013. Um, they asked me to focus primarily on evergreen huckleberries, and I did both quantitative plot-based studies of the huckleberries where we measured all sorts of things related to the huckleberries themselves, as well as the habitat that they were in, and also qualitative research where I did uh, semi-structured interviews with indigenous practitioners who were managing and using um, evergreen huckleberry and associated species. Um, and then I went and actually got um, a master's at the Virginia University of Integrative Medicine in acupuncture and Chinese medicine. So that's where I've never really been able to let go of the human health side. I'm not gonna talk about this as much today, but if it comes up in the questions, I'm happy to answer any questions there. And then for the last around eight months, I've uh, been employed by the Kudu Tribe Department of Natural Resources. Um, and I manage, as Anna said, the Pikyak Field Institute, which is really oriented around fostering intergenerational learning for Kodak people uh, around natural resources, which are not just natural resources, but they're cultural resources too. Um, and really integrating indigenous and Western sciences to support indigenous stewardship in a way that is indigenous led and indigenous directed. Uh, part of my role there is also to protect Kodak intellectual property in this process and to really uh, emphasize reciprocity. Um, so as many of you know, I'm just going to make a statement here that Indigenous people have managed ecosystems in intricate ways for thousands of years, and in many places they still do, including in California, um, and Indigenous peoples and their knowledge systems are still very important today. Um, so I tried to kind of distill some pieces out that would be relevant to One Health, but I think there are a lot of aspects that my research touches on that um, touch on One Health efforts. So. Um, I think the first aspect here is managing ecosystems and landscapes in a more comprehensive and holistic way. I really appreciate that about the One Health approach, that it breaks down silos. And I think from what I've learned of Indigenous um, perspectives, they, they are more holistic um, and very place-based. Um, so this includes understanding the social, natural, and ecological history of a wide range of species, some of which are not understood or studied by Western trained scientists um, due to some of the kind of policy frameworks that orient, you know, what, what we spend our time studying. 
um, stewarding and managing their species and their habitats in ways that both support, support the larger ecosystem while also providing food, fiber, fuel, and other needs for people. And this is part of um, a really a, a socio-ecological first approach. So one of my mentors and now my boss, Bill Tripp, who's a Kodak tribal member, and he's also the director of the Department of Natural Resources, um, would always say to me that before we harvest any species, we first provide habitat for them to survive, thrive, and reproduce. So really he sees himself as the steward of the habitat for the species. Um, and this kind of plays in a number of ways in how uh, these landscapes are managed. Um, so I'm just gonna touch really briefly on a little bit of my research. Um, I know I'm almost out of time, but I'll be happy to touch on more of this when we get to the Q and A. Um, so my graduate research was this, you know, how to integrate indigenous and Western sciences and natural resources management in the context of working with the Kodak and Yurok tribes, working in Northern California and focusing specifically on evergreen huckleberries. Um, I define Western science here as something with a core belief that there is an objective true reality that we seek to understand. We seek to understand it through using the scientific method with hypothesis testing, data collection, observation and or experimentation. We have sampling methodologies an abounded study system. This knowledge accumulates over time and within a social context. I'm sure many of us are very familiar with the context in which this occurs. Um, and I just wanted to say that to, to kind of compare and contrast that with indigenous science and management, uh, where there's a core belief that we are connected in relationship with and a part of the natural world. Um, this is a living adaptive knowledge system. It's often referred to as traditional ecological knowledge. However, I tend to refer to it as indigenous science just to capture the concept that it's not a knowledge that is necessarily stuck in time, but it is adaptive and evolving. Um, it is place-based, based on a need to survive in a particular place. Um, there's thousands of years of knowledge accumulation in many of these places. Um, and it also occurs within a social context through intergenerational transfer of knowledge from elders through cultural stories and ceremonies, and also an intragenerational where peers are sharing uh, knowledge uh, between themselves and across groups. Um, and then just to kind of show you where this is happening, where my research happened and where I live now, um, this is the border of Oregon and California, as you can see, and this is the Klamath River Basin. Um, this section of the Klamath River is where the kind of Aboriginal territory is. And as you can see here, this is a map on the right um, that Bill Bright documented 117 Kodak villages along the Klamath River. And this is not all of the villages that existed, but just the subset that he saw at the, that time. There are also many others in the high country and along tributaries, but just documenting and showing, you know, what a vast cultural landscape this is. Um, so the people that I worked with are the Karuk. Uh, Karuk means upriver, the Yurok, which means downriver, but that's actually a Karuk term. Um, and then the Hoopa people who live along the Trinity River. And these are some of the folks that I learned from uh, and worked with uh, and continue to work with today. Um, and then the context uh, is that there's ecological disturbance. There's uh, This is California mixed evergreen forests that have not had uh, regular indigenous management and indigenous burning in particular for the last roughly 100 years. So there's increased fuel fuel loads in the forest, threatening life, property, and food, as well as increased pest and disease risk. Um, due to these more homogeneous and dense forest stand structures. Um, additionally, a reduced resilience to fire because of the lack of burning, reduced indigenous management and reduced cultural foods, um, all in the context of changing weather patterns due to climate change. Um, the research has shown that there are these really two distinct periods of burning and the fire regime in this area. In the Native American and early Euro-American colonization period, which is before the 1920s roughly, there were more frequent and mixed severity, so a range from low to high severity fires with more on the low to mid severity. Um, less dense trees and the average was nine to 17 years between fires, but many places were burned annually, particularly around villages. Um, and now in the fire suppression era that started in the 20s to 40s and continues to today, there's less frequent and higher severity fires. More dense trees, as you can see, about three times more dense from recent studies and 21 to 47 years between fires on average, but many places that haven't burned in over 100 years. Um, so this is just some pictures of what, you know, this more dense, uh, more homogenous stands look like. This is some of the fire, this is a fire that actually broke out the day 
after I arrived in 2013 um, and it burned up a woman's home in the town here. Uh, and then this is the Slater fire that burned last year um, and burned 197 homes down uh, and killed two people in a, a very, um, this is where the administrative offices for the tribe are and a lot of people live. Um, and at the same time, there are human health issues. So rising levels of obesity and diabetes, inflammatory diseases, healthcare costs, a reduced consumption of nutrient dense foods, in particular, reduced cultural foods um, and reduced uh, interaction with nature for some people. Um, and this is especially prevalent in Native American communities. So this study system for me was really this intersection of these two challenges. And I think really epitomizes some of the One Health concepts because it is across all these different silos. And that is how do we enhance forest ecosystem function and resilience while enhancing human food security and health at the same time and in the same place. Um, and this is kind of the model of the socio-ecosystem here and native cultural foods, which evergreen huckleberries are one of them, um, but deer, elk, mushrooms, acorns all fall within that category as well, are really at that intersection. Um, so I just wanted to leave with a couple examples of some traditional ecological knowledge, One Health collaborative opportunities. I think that around the areas of health promotion, disease prevention and treatment, particularly for indigenous communities, it's really important to look at the role of traditional foods and medicines. Um, also a vision of what is possible for socio-ecological systems, I think is often uh, much more present in indigenous communities than in um, those who don't have that long time horizon and understanding of you know, what has been and what can be. And then also there's a more holistic and comprehensive understanding of ecosystem interaction. So food webs, the, how pathogens spread, um, how management actions affect different species. Um, so I can give you a couple of these examples just with huckleberries. Um, so their evergreen huckleberries is what I studied, as I mentioned, huge ceremonial and cultural importance. Um, and also high nutritional benefits. So high anthocyanin content in the literature um, among the highest of many other fruits, potentials to address type two diabetes, which is, as I mentioned, you know, one of the biggest health issues in, in Indian country, um, also cardiovascular disease, cancer, microbiome and gut health, autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. So there's beginning research into all of these properties of huckleberries and their associated cousins, the blueberries. Um, and it's also found to be nutritionally important for migratory birds and other animals. Um, it's been found that migratory birds selectively choose darker color fruits, perhaps because of these high antioxidant um, levels when they're about to make their migrations. Um, and then as far as the vision, this is kind of the Karuk agroforestry landscape uh, where you have these different levels of forest and different um, agroforestry systems within them. I'll just show a couple from the low elevation forests where I worked where you have um, these tan oak acorn groves, ideally these open canopies, trees can go to be much larger than they're currently growing today because it's not being burned. And um, these are some of the acorns that you get from those. This is what a huckleberry patch um, looks like. One of the best examples of the ones that I studied um, where you have kind of mixed filtered light um, and more berries per cluster and per bush here. And that's a huckleberry pie in the low left. Um, there's uh, mushrooms, particular kind of mushrooms out here that grows in symbiotic relationship with both the tan oak trees and the um, huckleberries. And then uh, Roosevelt elk and black-tailed deer, which are also important species in the, in the entire cosmology for critic people and um, food. Um, and then part of my interviews, um, I uncovered all of these different species that had interactions with huckleberry that were not previously known to the Western science literature. So uh, species that consume, pollinate, or live within huckleberries from mammals to birds to reptiles to insects. Um, and then indigenous burning. So fire is a key management tool for Kuduk and Yurok and Hoopa people. Um, and it rejuvenates many plant species, including huckleberries. So there's a food security aspect of the importance of burning. Um, and burning has been you know, prohibited um, since the early 1900s out here. Um, cultural burning also creates patchy mosaics, fostering heterogeneity at the landscape level. Um, this reduces the risk of pests and disease infestation, things like pine bark beetle and uh, sudden oak death potentially, um, when there's more open understory and there's uh, less you know, monoculture of uh, trees altogether. 
Um, culture burning beneath acorn trees has been used to interrupt the life cycle of uh, insects that consume acorns like the filbert weevils and the filbert worm, both because of the smoke that goes up into the canopy and also burning out under and into the litter and duff below the tree. Uh, and then burning to black, which happens in lower intensity burns, produces charcoal that some species consume to address internal parasites. Um, and then the last thing is I'm just going to say that there are some important considerations that I think I have to mention uh, when working with Indigenous communities. Um, it's important to be ever aware of your intentions. Um, there can be an extraction ethic present with uh, those of us who are raised in a more Western culture. Um, first it was the gold rush and then it was timber and, and now there's a concern within Indigenous communities of extracting traditional ecological knowledge or data. Um, so it's important to really be aware of those potentially that those could be intentions um, and ensure that knowledge does not leave the community solely to you know, be published, but it, that it's actually used to ensure that benefits accrue to the community. Um, the work should be conducted within the context of long-term relationship and trust building, which I believe was mentioned before. Um, intellectual property rights should be discussed and attributed to the indigenous stewards and knowledge holders when possible. Um, and respectful and adequate compensation for people's time is also something that I've found um, really important in doing this work. Um, and lastly, um, now that I work in a tribal government, I have a much uh, bigger understanding of some of the capacity constraints um, tribal governments have just because they're asked to comment and consult on a lot of things for with state and federal agencies that state and federal agencies have much more people able to do that. So. Um, it can become a burden even though the consultation is desired. So it's just something to keep in mind and be aware of when you're asking for the time of someone working in the tribal government. And with that, um, thank you so much for listening and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Rossier. Um, next up, we have Dr. Joe Gatos. Dr. Gatos is the Senior Wildlife Veterinarian and Science Director for the Sea Doc Society, a science-based marine conservation program of the UC Davis Karen C. Dreyer Wildlife Health Center. Uh, he has many notable accomplishments, but as a wildlife veterinarian, he works to address diseases in wildlife at the indiv individual animal level, as well as at the population level. Uh, and also as a translational scientist, he connects people to the amazing resources of the Salish Sea and has given numerous keynote presentations and testified on the current state of the science on marine wildlife conservation issues to groups like the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, the Washington Fish and Wildlife Commission, and the Washington State Senate. So please welcome Dr. Davis. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you, Colleen. That was a really great introduction. I'm going to uh, share my screen and just give you a little bit of a background. A lot of the things that I'm going to talk about, I think you're going to find are very similar uh, to what C Colleen was talking about, but I just want to take you to the uh, place where I work, which is in the Salish Sea. Before I do that, like Colleen, I want you to recognize this is my grandmother in the center, and that's my my father in the middle. We're not Coast Salish people, <laughs> uh, you know. In fact, uh, my my grandfather was a coal miner in Pennsylvania. My mom was born just across the border, West West Virginia, and you can tell I was a very white boy with very long socks. Um, and I just moved out to this area about 20 years ago. And so it's a beautiful place. I love showing pictures of the mountains and the ocean and the islands because I think it encompasses that what we work in is an ecosystem. It's a, it's a place-based conservation program, uh, science-based, but we're working at the whole ecosystem, not just the marine water, but the fresh water that comes down into it as well. And if you look at uh, a satellite image, you can see the entire Salish Sea, almost the entire Salish Sea here. It's from a little bit of a strange angle, but I think it's real important to remember that we have this uh, international border that goes something like this uh, with Canada on the right, which is really on the north, and the United States on the left on the south. So if we looked at it from a map that we're more used to a north-south orientation, I think you can appreciate the inland sea nature, you can appreciate the mountains and the ocean, and then I think you can see uh, the two nations. And, and actually it's way more than two nations. Uh, those are the two nations we talk about a lot, but really this was home and is still home, which I think is really important to the Coast Salish and other tribes and First Nations. And so I'll show you a picture here of the, the different uh, languages and the different territories that were in this area before white people came. And these Indian uh, tribes and First Nations are still in the area now. North of the border in Canada, 
the First Nations, uh, the Coast Salish, do not have tribal treaty rights. They have indigenous rights under the United Nations, but it's very different in Washington state. And so in Washington state, here you can see a very small reservation. There are 19 Northwest Treaty tribes, not all of them. Uh, for example, the Samish Nation doesn't have a reservation, um, but they signed treaties with the US government, okay? So first of all, they, they back in, um, there are actually six treaties. The most famous one is the 1855 Treaty of Point Elliot. Um, and what happened at that time, they, they ceded territory um, for the reservations, but they kept rights to be able to hunt and fish in their traditional, uh, usual and accustomed fishing areas. We did not do a good job of upholding this. And it wasn't until 1974 that these tribal treaty rights came under scrutiny legally. And uh, it was primarily dealing with salmon, so fish. And Judge Bolt said, look, this is about, you know, they, they gave us half of these resources, and yet we've taken all of these resources away from them. And uh, it was not till several decades later, this Rafiti decision, that people realized it wasn't just about the salmon, it was also about the shellfish, it was about elk and things like that. And uh, Rafiti said in that decision, a treaty is not a grant of rights to the Indians, but a grant of rights from them. And I think that's really important for us to remember that these treaties, and I'm constantly reminded, are not Indian treaties. They're treaties between the tribes and us as settlers or white people that have moved into the area. So we both have an obligation to uphold these treaty rights that, that we signed a long, long time ago. Um, so let's see. I like to start with uh, this picture. This is a, a Western red cedar tree and, and some fresh water moving down in the ocean. Again, like showing those mountaintops, we think of this as an estuary, but I think trees and plants get the shaft a lot of times, Colleen, this one's for you, um, in the One Health picture. And Western red cedars really, for the Coast Salish, is a gift to them. It's their tree of life. It pr provides material for canoes, for baskets, for carving, for medicine, all kinds of different things like that. Another thing that's really important for the Coast Salish are salmon. We have five different species of salmon in the area, and they will tell you they are the people of the salmon. That is their food, that is their culture, that is their identity. And from a wildlife biology perspective, salmon are just key to the ecosystem, right? They feed all kinds of different animals. You know, we see birds eating them, we see bears eating them, uh, we see species we don't even recognize, like uh, American dippers eating them. And I think a lot of times from that, as a biologist, we need to be thinking about that one health perspective. So salmon are feeding 138 different vertebrates, let alone the trees, let alone the bugs, the bacteria, things like that. And when salmon populations are now down four to 6% of what they used to be. So we've lost 90, you know, 94 to 96% of those salmon. And the people that are really harmed are the Coast Salish. Remember, these are the people of the salmon. And not only do they have not enough salmon to eat uh, that are returning, but they don't even have enough salmon sometimes to perform their traditional ceremonies like this first salmon ceremony. And so where I can go and get some salmon at Costco, that's fine. That's not what their culture is about. That's not what it dictates. And so losing that salmon is not only an ecological disaster, it's a human rights disaster for the Coast Salish people in this area. And I think it's really important to remember that. Also, water quality is important. You know, for us to not go swimming, that's one thing, but for them to not be able to harvest clams, they're not gonna go to a fancy restaurant and buy clams. Part of their tradition is the collection of those clams. It's a process and it's a life way. And so I think we need to remember that and look at it from their perspective and, and really, you know, it's not even just not about having enough salmon, but the salmon that we do have are so contaminated that they can't eat the salmon at the level that they traditionally have consumed it, which is probably in some, time, some places six times as much as we've had or, or traditionally eat, say, in, in a family like mine. And so you see a lot of pictures like this of uh, Edward Curtis. It's really important to remember when you're working in the Salish Sea area, nobody wants to see this picture. This, this picture says they were here. These are the traditional lands of, i.e. they're gone. 
That's not the case. They want this picture. We are here, we're now, we're a part of this ecosystem. And probably most importantly, we are a part of the solutions for fixing this place. When this picture was taken, I showed this to one of the Squamish elders, Maureen Thomas. She said, I said, I love that you are protesting the Kinder Morgan pipeline. She said, Joe, we're not just protesting, we're protecting the resources that we need and that you all need. We're in this together. And that was a really good wake up reminder to me that we are in this together. And even though in Canada, they don't have tribal treaty rights, they do have those rights in Washington state and they are the supreme law of the land. And so we've been fortunate to work with Coast Salish tribes and First Nations on different projects. This is one example. And they came to us and they said, look, there's a lot of stuff going on. Someone's putting an LNG terminal. Someone's putting in a coal terminal. Someone wants to expand this and, and they want to you know, develop xylene at this place. And when is too much? And we said, well, let's Let's sit down and talk about that. What's and I said, you know, kind of naively to them, what's important to you? Tell tell me what's important. They said, Joe, everything is important. Everything is connected. I said, that's hard to do a risk assessment on everything. So let's winnow it down. You know, so <clears throat> we're able to work together and use their information and our information to come to solutions that help them make decisions, and then also can help us make decisions through peer review publications in the court of law. And not too long after this, not claiming any success at all, but the Lummi Nation was faced with uh, an expansion of uh, bringing in a coal terminal to their native area. And they said, look, no, it's a tribal treaty. It's against our tribal treaty rights. We don't want to have it. And it squashed the whole development of that. And so not saying that this paper did that, but this is the example of why they want this information, how they can use it to protect themselves, and how we as Western Seitner scientists can be partners on this. Another example is kelp, just like those delicious huckleberries that we we're looking at. Kelp is like a superfood of the Salish Sea, and there is a big resurgence in harvesting kelp. And the Coast Salish continued to ask, what about contamination levels? What should we be concerned about? And so we were able to fund a scientist at Western Washington University to do her master's. And she went out to all of these tribes and First Nations and said, I know you're interested in this. Let's go to your traditional areas. Let's sample your traditional areas. Let's look at all the possibilities of things that could be adding to contamination. And let's come back and let you know if you can harvest there safely and how much you can harvest. And this, this was funded by so private citizens giving us money, a donation. And you know we're, we're impetuous. We, where's the publication? Where's the answer? And this has been going on almost for, for seven years now because just like Colleen was saying at the end of her presentation that she said beautifully that when you go to these people and you are getting information from them, they have the right to get that information before you come out with a peer reviewed publication. Don't make the mistake of publishing something and handing it to them and assuming that it's something that they can read or understand or be helpful, because that's just not the way that they work. And so Jenny Hahn is in the process of going back to every single different group that she worked with to give a presentation, to talk to them about the findings, and to actually ask their permission, can't she put a dot on the map where they collected, or would they prefer not to have that on the map? Would they prefer not to have the numbers on there? And so it's a very iterative process. It's about trust. It's about providing information that they need and they're providing access that we need as well. It's, it's a true partnership. And so, you know, with that in mind, I think we, we need to be respectful and thoughtful. There's a lot that we can learn. There's a lot that we can give and share. It's a beautiful team relationship. This is a picture of Billy Frank Jr. who's passed away since this picture was taken, but I feel lucky that I was able to work with Billy Frank Jr. He's a hero in my mind and a lot of other people's minds for, for tribal treaty rights in Washington and in British Columbia. And I think if I had to leave with one message, um, and then we can go on to the panel after one more presentation, talk less, listen more. We've got a lot, lot more to learn from them than they have to learn from us. And so uh, be there, be in, be in a relationship with them, have that trusting relationship, don't be in a hurry. And, um, and I think we have a lot to do together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gatos.
Next, we have Carly Times Hassel. Uh, Carly is from Gold Bay First Nation and grew up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. She currently serves as the Indigenous Engagement Coordinator with the Navigating the New Arctic Community Office team and is based in Anchorage, Alaska. As an Indigenous environmental scholar and practitioner, Carly has over 10 years of experience in coordinating Indigenous-led education, outreach, and land-based projects. She has a broad background in human environment systems, including expertise in equitable engagement strategies for knowledge co-production. Co her traditional values and knowledge continue, continually guide her approach to research collaboration. Carly liaises across interdisciplinary teams and sectors and aims to strengthen relationships or connections among indigenous communities, academia and scientists, policymakers and managers, tribal organizations, and research collaboration for sustainable future. I'm very excited to introduce Carly Tynes Hassel. Thank you so much, Anna, for the wonderful introduction. So, Buju Anin, Carly Tynes Hassel, and Indigenica, Janishnabek, Gwe Kyashagi, Nishnabek, Nindonjaba, Megazi, Manamek Dodams. So like Anna had mentioned, I'm from the community of Gold Bay First Nation that's located in Northwestern Ontario in Canada. And like she had mentioned, I have a really broad background in environmental science and I currently serve as the Indigenous Engagement Coordinator um, at the Community Extension Office at uh, Alaska Pacific University. And I just wanna take one brief moment and humbly acknowledge the Denina lands uh, who are the traditional stewards and caretakers of the lands that I'm calling in from today. Uh, in Anchorage, Alaska. And thanks to my fellow panel members, Joan and Colleen, who have provided amazing examples and um, wonderful lessons learned and, you know, working in partnership with Indigenous communities. Um, and so although my professional identity as an Indigenous researcher in a Western university setting, um, I just wanted to share uh, about Edwap de Monk or the two I'd seen framework um, and so my, my values and traditional teachings as Anishinaabe Kwe or Anishinaabe woman um, include Minobamadzawin, which is the good life, um, the seven grandfather teachings, uh, the principle of all my relations, which, you know, really play into a one health perspective. Um, but all of these things really influence and shape my research approaches. And in my culture, we are taught to exhibit reciprocity and to learn from our greatest teacher uh, the land, the waters, the animal and plant relations. And so this philosophy philosophy or um, view of land is really ingrained into our culture and embedded into our languages. And as a result, you know, the ethics and values about land, um, it becomes more significant and challenging to describe against, um, you know, Western science. And, you know, my Western university education really contributed to my understanding of, you know, the scientific method or government and bureaucratic processes within natural resource management. Um, I just, I really wanted to present this framework, uh, the two I'd seen framework as a way to respectfully bring together these knowledge systems. Um, and so you can see a quote there. Um, so Edewapta Monk, it's, uh, it's a, a Mi'kmaq word from uh, an elder, Albert Marshall, uh, it's a model for co-advancement to reconcile, acknowledge, and acknowledge these two approaches of, of knowing and understanding the world um, with acknowledgement to research orientation um, to really inform transcultural and interdisciplinary projects that are considerate of different epistemologies. And so this quote here, I'm just going to read it. It's learning to see from one eye with the strengths of Indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and from the other eye, the strengths of mainstream knowledges and ways of knowing or Western science, and to use both these eyes together for the benefit of all. And so, you know, this, this two way seeing framework is really um, bringing together traditional knowledge and Western science. And um, it's, it's really all about co-development, co-run, and co-evaluated um, processes that brings together interdisciplinary projects um, and different teams of conducting research uh, investigation and really leverages many tools and perspectives towards imagining better futures for One Health that impacts all of us. Um, and 
it really leads to a wider, deeper, and more generative view um, that's achieved uh, together as opposed to just using one or the other. And um, really the two I'd seen framework uh, very much centers on process rather than outcome. And so you could see a couple of really positive impacts that this approach provides. And two I'd seen is really guided by four principles of respect, reverence, reciprocity, uh, responsibility, and really encourages bringing your full self to science and leaning into or embracing your intersex intersectionality. Um, that is important. Um, and it provides a holistic One Health approach or, or view. And so um, you could see on the screen here, there are just a couple of really amazing um, um, positive impacts that this framework can provide. But really, it's, it's not helicopter research. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a case study. And so I just wanted to take a trip to Nanwalik. Um, it's a Alaska Native village that is located um, on the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. And Nanwalik is a Sukhbiak community um, that has roughly 300 residents. And I worked with them in collaboration and I still am working with them today. Uh, that was part of my master's thesis research. So um, you could see that there's some drone footage of the wonderful English Bay Lake system there. And this lake system um, and the community is actually off the road system. So it's only accessible by um, air or by plane. You can see the video there, there's a, a lagoon and that little strip of land is actually the, the airport runway. Um, so that can be fun to try to get into the community, community on really windy days. But essentially um, the community approached the Fisheries Aquatic Science and Technology Lab at APU at the university uh, with concerns about the decline of the sockeye salmon run. And so um, a step one in this process, process was really to learn about um, and establish trust and a relationship um, through mutual understanding. And this, you know, really meant getting to know the people and their sense of place as it relates to them and their system um, and where our place is as a research lab and how we could offer, um, you know, technical advice or expertise in answering some community-centered questions or concerns. And so we met with Nan Wallach chief and council. We hosted community meetings. We listened, uh, conducted programming with youth at the school. And we listened and listened a little bit more. Um, and so we observed the system, made notes about um, human dimensions and community processes through both a scientific and a traditional ecological lens. And so through those meetings, you know, this is what we heard. You know, the system really contains the only wild sock stock of sockeye salmon um, that's native to the southern district of the, the lower cook and let management area. And the elders were saying that they used to see historical highs exceeding over 40,000 fish at one time, but currently escapement levels are roughly five to 6,000 on a good year, um, with some years dipping well below 3,000 uh, fish that return. And there have been numerous attempts by other outside entities to try to stop the lakes, um, uh, with hatchery fry, and that has been unsuccessful. But I wanted to mention that the community also runs their own weir to monitor salmon escapement. They hire their own technicians, um, they deploy smolt traps, and then the, they report the numbers back to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. But, you know, one question that the community had was, how can we improve the fishery for future generations to come? You know, the community really wanted more self-determination and autonomy to make more informed management decisions where data products will be in the community, um, used for the community, and really just improve knowledge and understanding of the system. And so um, we decided to tackle these, these community-based concerns with a couple of um, different options. So we use um, small unmanned aerial systems or drones to kind of characterize the physical landscape you know, conducted water quality and water temperature monitoring. Um, fishermen mentioned that there's two distinct runs that arrive at different times during the spawning season, something that the Alaska Department of Fish and Game didn't know or, or were, were aware about, but that really just shows that community knowledge really needs to be driving um, research investigation and management um, or stewardship of these uh, natural resources. And, um, 
basically, you know, the, the perspective and history, it's fish as relations. So this fishery is so important um, for cultural identity, for sustainability, for way of life, you know, uh, for food security. And, you know, basically food in these communities can be really, really expensive. Um, and so that's why they fish and they, um, they put away fish for the rest of the year. And if, if it's a bad year for, for fish to return, that really impacts um, putting away food for the winter time. And so through this process, we also visited with the school. We talked about fishery science, post-secondary education. We invited um, university grad students through an ichthyology class to visit the community. And really the ripple effects of this project impacted everyone from researchers to students to community members in different ways. And storytelling or oration since time immemorial has been used to transmit knowledge, pass down oral history and reflect on lived experiences. And what I wanted to do was capture these perspectives through interviews uh, at the end of my degree and it was just, it was amazing to see how this project impacted people in different ways to improve science, to improve community health. Um, and we also created a fishery working group to improve the understanding of, you know, the biological param parameters impacting science, or sockeye. Um, and as a result, tribal entities and fishery managers will, you know, be able to address barriers to inclusive fishery management make informed decisions, um, ensure that subsistence and salmon needs are, are met for future generations. And to this day, um, we still have ongoing relationships with the community. We are meeting monthly to conduct strategic planning exercises, um, to produce a fishery stewardship plan um, that really speaks to the longevity and partnership sustainability. And perhaps we can talk a little bit about these challenges um, through the panel, but I just want to mention that there are, you know, barriers that we've encountered or, or um, challenges that are unique to systemic barriers that impact doing this work in a good way. You know, academic or grant-based timelines are often at odds with community-based timelines. Um, regulations and, and policies impact tribal sovereignty. And um, I just want to end with um, this slide here. Uh, so really 218 encourages researchers and communities to engage in a manner that is respectful to both worldviews. It doesn't aim to assimilate or dominate either knowledge systems. And indigenous communities, researchers, and professionals have really um, long sounded the call for community-based research that is directly relevant and beneficial to their community. So you know, if you're doing environmental-based research, you need to be talking to and collaborating with Indigenous communities um, early in the research process, uh, ensuring that you're co-designing research with communities through research and budget design, through implementation and sustainable partnerships. Um, and, it, you know, I just want to also briefly mention that November is Native American um, and Alaska Native Heritage Month. Um, so I just want to also post in the chat um, this link afterwards, you know, whose, uh, whose lands are you studying on? Um, if you're not sure, I'll drop a link in the chat and you can find out. But this is a really, really important thing to do and recognize um, and just, you know, ensure that we're collaborating in a good way. So with that, I just want to say miigwech. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Thank you so much for that presentation, Carly, and for those resources really important. And um, thank you all for your presentation. So now we will move into the Q&A portion. So um, feel free to add your questions to the Q&A. Um, so our first question, um, I think Carly will start with you and um, feel free to chime in everybody. Um, how do we strengthen or sector center equity and indigenous, indigenous knowledge in solutions for One Health issues? Yeah, so I think I, I briefly mentioned a couple of different approaches, but um, ensuring that we're engaging with communities from the get-go. You know, if you have a research idea, um, maybe there are different ways that we can collaborate together to bring people in, um, calling them in, 
and working across different disciplines and teams and ensuring that you're applying equitable, equitable approaches. So I briefly mentioned, um, you know, when you're designing a research project, um, ensuring that there's a community member there to um, voice their concerns so that their concerns are directly at the center of research investigation. And through that, you'll, um, ex you'll, you'll realize that there are so many benefits. Um, you could also, you know, work directly with com community members to um, have community technicians or to build capacity, um, encourage knowledge translation. And again, it's just, it's really a collaborative, uh, equitable approach to, to research. Awesome. Thank you for that. Does anyone else have anything to add, Colleen? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. How do we strengthen or center equity and Indigenous knowledge in solutions for One Health issues? Yeah, I really do think it um, it's so important, and I definitely echo what Carly was saying. Um, I mean, you know, I've seen a number of different ways that this collaboration can work, I guess, in, in my experience, and I think, you know, what we're trying to do currently within the Kaduk Tribe Department of Natural Resources is really um, reach out to the community here and have those research interests that come from the community be the things that we're really centering on. Um, there, you know, at the same time, there, there will be requests from researchers who have interests um, in this landscape and desire to collaborate. Um, but sometimes I think we can get really focused on, on someone, someone outside of the community's research interests and that pulls a lot of bandwidth away from kind of centering on the community needs. And like Carly was describing with the project that she described, there are so many um, beautiful ripple effects um, from you know, really taking the, the time necessary to build those relationships uh, and to work on projects that are seen as big community needs um yeah so i think i think as much as possible centering the whole goal of the research on uh an identified community need and being open to what that might look like as a researcher and not necessarily coming in with like this is what the research project needs to be from the outset um is important and then i think also you know respecting people's time um, and understanding that, you know, maybe as a researcher, you might be funded through some grant or, you know, your salary, but uh, if you're working with community members, I think it's important to make sure that they're um, compensated for their time and also, you know, as I mentioned, kind of that the intellectual property piece um, is discussed and, and, you know, whose knowledge that's uh, being attributed to and who is accruing the benefits and how those benefits um, you ensure that it's really meeting the community need uh, first and foremost before um, anyone else. So I think those are some of the pieces. Um, we, we have what's called a practicing pick off process at the, in the Kodak Tribe Department of Natural Resources where there's community, um, there's a research committee that's kind of a corollary to like a university research committee that is a member of three people who kind of oversee any research that happens. Um, and we also have um, some intellectual property rights uh, agreements and conversations up front at the beginning of uh, the process to make sure that everybody kind of understands what's going on there and, and what the expectations are as far as publication goes and copyrights and trademarks, et cetera. Thank you. Joe, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that what, what Carly and Colleen said was right. It, you know, start early. Don't, don't come and bring your ideas and say, I want to do this. Uh, can you help me? Um, but start with the question. Start with a problem and, and, and design things. I mean, we, we learned that working, you know, there's good publications, not even just working with, uh, with uh, Indigenous communities, but also if you want to work with a fishing community, if you want to work with other communities, engage them from the beginning through the process and at the end of the process. And then, you know, don't just hand people a scientific paper at the end and expect that it's gonna mean anything or be helpful to anything except for you. Awesome, thank you. 
Um, our next question, Colleen, I think you touched on this, um, but what does traditional ecological knowledge extraction look like and how can we ensure that we are not being extractive? in our indigenous and Western science collaboration. Um, Colleen, if you wanna go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I did touch on it and I think that um, it's something to be very aware of. I certainly, you know, when I first came out here as a graduate student researcher, I, I felt that, you know, drive towards, oh, I need to publish. This is what I need to do for me to, uh, you know, move through my career. And I really had to check that in myself of, you know, what are you here for? Um, and slow down the process. And um, I think what it looks like is, you know, interviewing people, getting that data and publishing it, uh, you know, in, in journal articles, in books, uh, but having the intellectual property and the funding then go to the whoever that helicopter researcher is or person who came in and isn't you know, um, and that's not really benefiting the community at all. If anything, that could have a number of negative ripple effects from it. Um, and I think that we have to be really aware in this kind of culture of data mining, um, you know, in some contexts that's okay. And in some contexts that's really, you know, that's not uh, an appropriate way of conducting research uh, in collaboration with indigenous people. Um, and it just is carrying on a legacy of uh, systemic racism um, and extraction that's been going on for, for generations. So um, I think that's something to really dig deep on your intentions when you're in a place and, and to let yourself be checked, you know, when, when people say, hey, maybe that isn't a good research idea, or maybe that isn't going to benefit us. And what, what are, you know, how is that going to benefit us? I think that's something that people, I mean, I, you know, as a researcher needed to really sit with um, and continue to recenter the community benefit and the uh, ecosystem benefit and and put my my needs at the bottom of that list. Thank you. Carly, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, exactly what Colleen had said. And I had dropped a link in the chat that talks about the cares, the care principles for indigenous data governance. And this particular um, paper um, and data governance um, group of people who, you know, provide some advice on, on what to do and what not to do. Um, you can read a little bit more there, but yeah, again, it's thinking about care principles. Care stands for collective benefit, authority to control, um, responsibility and ethics. So it's all connected and there's some really great frameworks um, and papers if you just, you know, you go to that website and you can take a look, but um, like, a, like Colleen did mention, mention, indigenous data sovereignty is, is super important. So, um, you, you know, like a lot of communities, if you, if you ask to collaborate, some of them will shut, shut the door right away because they have had such a bad history with, with researchers coming in, doing helicopter research, and not providing any benefit to the community. So um, really thinking about a decolonial viewpoint, um, I would love to see indigenous communities leading these research projects, being PIs, principal investigators, getting the funding themselves, as opposed to just you know, writing communities in on a grant um, to do this research. I would love for the funding to go directly to community, um, hiring community members, uh, you know, thinking about ways to, um, you know, work with the school, like I mentioned that in this project. Um, and again, like, you know, you really see the ripple effect and how this um, decolonial process or, or indigenous process impacts people in different ways, as opposed to the standard helicopter research approach. Um, so yeah, start early, um, think about protections of indigenous knowledge, and um, intellectual property rights and, and publishing. Um, these are all very, very important uh, things to consider early. Awesome, thank you for that. And thank you for those resources. That's really helpful. Um, I guess we have time for a couple more questions. So um, 
What are some limitations you have found in engaging tribal or First Nation participation in ecosystem recovery? Dr. Gatos, if you want to take that one. Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking. I think I think Colleen and, and Carly have both touched on this before. I think you know, a lot of times we ask a lot and give back very little. And and so that needs to change. If, if we expect people to attend meetings, if we expect or hope to, to work with people, people need to be compensated for that. Everyone is not in a position in their job where if they go and participate in discussions about whether they be metrics for ecosystem recovery or things that need to be done, you know, they don't necessarily have time to do that. And you're taking away from something else that that they may be resource limited, time limited, and things like that. So I think the expectation should be that you know you people are compensated for what they do and and compensated fairly for that and i think seeing it from a, a collective standpoint of you know what are the, what are the concerns you have what are the concerns we have and and how can we be teammates on on you know bringing that stuff together so i think you know recognizing it as a, a collaborative effort and then also as i think that carly and colleen both said being able to check yourself when someone says yeah, we're not going to share that information. You have to say, that's great. Okay, no problem. That's that's your information to decide where you're going to share it and not share it. Just because we have, you know, Western concepts of open, open access science or whatever it might be. That's great. You've been burned before and you need to watch out for that or, or, or protect for that. Thank you. Um, Colleen, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think you're talking about, you know, some of the challenges. Um, I would just say, you know, I really, I, I echo, you know, what both Joe and Carly are saying and what Carly was saying about, um, you know, having indigenous PIs and community members really leading these projects. And, and like I was saying, kind of indigenous directed, indigenous led efforts um, to center those perspectives and, and make sure that that's, you know, we're really, you know, looking at what's important here. Um, but I would say some of the barriers to that, at least what I'm seeing here is um, in our, you know, in the Kudik tribe, just governance, um, I mean, the best way that I describe it, like I've worked in the federal government, I worked in nonprofit sector, and it feels like there's, there's a federal level of bureaucracy and there's a, a nonprofit funding mechanism. So it's constant grants management. It's not sufficient baseline funding because the baseline funding is based on a BIA formula that's based on trust lands that were, you know, there was a treaty signed here in California, but it was never ratified by the Senate. And it, you know, didn't include all of Aboriginal territory, which is the, the full scope of what could people see as their inherent responsibility to manage. So there's this big disjoint in how much baseline funding um, is required. So there's a, there's a lot of time that's spent in just managing the funding mechanisms. And so to be able to be, you know, full players at the table with um, academic institutions, um, you know, requires a, a bigger investment. Um, and so what, what the Kudik tribe is trying to do is build an endowment um, for uh, long-term indigenous stewardship here. And that includes um, the ability of the tribe to collaborate with um, scientists, Western and indigenous scientists um, in a, in a co-production of knowledge method. I really, I really liked Carly, how you described it um, beautifully in your presentation. Um, so I, I did wanna just touch on, there has been this conversation about uh, land grab universities. I don't know how much everyone here is familiar with that conversation, um, but that's certainly an ask that the Kudik tribe has been making is for universities to be looking at their own endowments and where those funding, the funding for them came from, um, many of them did come from stolen indigenous lands. And so um, in order for tribes to be able to be bigger players at the table, um, thinking about kind of some of these, yeah, colonial processes and the history of, of why, you know, some organizations have more power than others, I think is a really important thing to be looking kind of internally in a systematic way. Um, and I think it would help to address some of the challenges of, of you know, whose questions are being centered and um, who's able to show up at the table. So thank you. Thanks for that insight. Carly, do you have anything to add? Yeah, 
Yeah, I will just say sometimes um, the table has to be flipped um, <laughs> and, and re-examined or even rebuilt uh, to, to rectify some of those uneven power relations, right? Um, you know, the university that, that I'm currently working at is trying to become a tribal university. So um, we have like an elders advisory council, you know, over 80% of our board of trustees are indigenous people. Um, and this is really amazing. You know, it, it's amazing to see that the positive change, um, how indigenous knowledge is, um, I don't want to say being incorporated, but um, I should say informing uh, a lot of our, our curriculum now. And um, yeah, the, I guess there's just, you know, several barriers that we kind of have to, to overcome. And, you know, if there are any indigenous scholars on the, the Zoom today in the symposium, like I'm just, I wanna say I'm so proud of you. And I recognize that it can be hard to speak up in these spaces. Um, it can be uncomfortable, um, you know, but we need you, you know. Uh, we need you to to be in these spaces and recognize that, you know, the your backpack that you carry around, uh, a metaphorical backpack, can be heavy and burdensome sometimes, but uh, you don't have to do it alone. You know, you can lean on your allies, you can lean on your colleagues, uh, other Indigenous peoples, classmates, um, and you just recognize you don't have to go alone. You know, we're all in this together. It's a one health approach, right? Um, this is what we're, we're here for. And um, yeah, I just want to say thanks again for, for inviting um, me here, Anna. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Carly. And thank you all so much for taking the time to be here. That's all the time we have for this panel. Um, but thank you so much for all of your great insights and your ideas. Um, it's been an honor hosting you on this panel, and uh, this is a really important conversation and topic to continue talking about. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you all being here and, and learning from you. So thank you again. Um,